Okay, I'll just start with a question about bridging therapies. Um, so you were talking about antibody drug conjugates, and I was wondering if you can use that as a bridging therapy, even though you might be doing some BCMA targeted therapies following that. And there are, and then when you think about the immunotherapies, are there bridging therapies that are some are good and then helping your immune system, or some that are not so good and potentially could be damaging? You want to take that green initially? <laughs> sure. Um, we both do immunotherapy. So I think the first question is a very valid question um, about the target. So I think as we get new biospecifics and CAR T's against different antigens, I think the future is going to be hands down, yes, we can use one or the other. Um, and, and likely we would use different antigens so that you're not decreasing the expression, right? So I think anecdotally, we know we can use a BCMA ADC, for instance, and then go to a bispecific or a CAR-T and still see responses. But I think at a more global level, we don't know. We have a few patients that lose their BCMA, usually our patients with 17P um, because of where BCMA is expressed. But again, we don't know as much about BCMA expression. We, we do know we don't have a huge loss, but we do see some dimming. So if you don't have as much expression and then I give you CAR-Ts, they can't find those myeloma cells as well. Well, did we just do you just you know a disservice? Um, so I think we're we're learning more and more now that we have these standard of care products. Um, but again, I think our goal is to get the best response before you move on to uh, you know a, a CAR T, for instance. So bridging we usually use for CAR T. So I think it's going to be different antigens. As of right now, do we use it? Yes, if I don't have anything else and I need to get that myeloma down, we are. Um, but we'll, hopefully that data will help us say in a more global scale, what should we really be doing? And for the second question, this is a great question again. What can we do during bridging that can actually improve your outcome for CAR-T when you have the infusion? I have lots to say before apheresis um, because we know that there's certain drugs that will damage your T cells. Um, and other drugs that could actually improve your T cells. So right now, I think we don't have all the data out there, but what we're seeing trends of is if you use um, sort of immunomodulatory drugs or other immune drugs before collection, you can actually make T cells better. So when they're collected, you get a better CAR T product. This is some of the data that um, I think uh, Dr. Orlowski talked about earlier in some of the, tr the, the translational research we're doing. So hopefully that will give us some answers. For bridging, it's a little bit harder. We know that the patients who have better disease control going into CAR-Ts do better. So they have usually less CRS and less neurotoxicity, for instance. Um, there's less myeloma for those T cells to have to kill. So they, they usually do a better job of it without the, the extra toxicity. But the question is how low do you need it? So the other debate we have right now is that if patients have no myeloma based on what we know, based on the testing we can do. So if patients are MRD negative, like after transplant, for instance, you know, would giving T cells actually work or not? And there's trials looking at that right now. So I hope we'll have an answer for that. In leukemia, we know that if someone's even MRD positive, we wanna treat it back down again. In myeloma, we've never really had that paradigm before. So I think with cell therapy, hopefully we'll be able to answer some of those questions. Yeah, just to add a couple of points, I agree with all those points. And, you know, I think this kind of addresses the broader question, how do we sequence all these BCMA targeted therapeutic modalities, antibody drug conjugates, biosic T-cell antibodies, and CAR-T therapies? And in terms of bridging therapy, you know, you know, will there be some detriment of using a bispecific or an ADC to target BCMA prior to the CAR-T um, infusion? We don't have that data yet. You know, these therapies are fairly new. That data will be generated over the next couple of years. That'll be very, very important data. At least for right now, in the absence of data, I do have a little bit of personal hesitancy of giving a, a BCMA target therapy prior to a CAR-T infusion, um, you know, if there are other options available. If an abuse may target therapy, um, like an ADC is the only therapy option, then certainly we would want to uh, give some good bridging therapy, at least to keep the disease and the myeloma under control. You know, there's gonna be different mechanisms of resistance, I'm sure that will be outlined and elucidated as we get more data. Uh, the incidence of BCMA loss, as Dr. Patel was alluding to, is fairly low in CAR-T resistance. It's less than 10% or so. And there's been some reports that 
there's what we call biallelic loss of 16P. So BCMA is actually on chromosome number 16, the small arm of chromosome number 16. And there's in some reports that, uh, that some patients may develop loss of 16P on both arms of the chromosome, essentially losing their BCMA expression. But those incidences probably are fairly rare. And other types of treatments like antibody drug conjugates or by antibodies are continuous therapy. You're giving therapy on a regular basis. Uh, potentially the mechanism of loss of BCMA could be a little bit higher in such patients um, than perhaps uh, BCMA directed CAR T's. We don't know for sure yet. That data will need to be uh, you know, uh, analyzed and come out hopefully in the next couple of years or so. We have a number of questions online uh, that have been submitted. Uh, and what was the one I was just going to ask? Uh, ah, are there any trials or new treatments for 17P deletion? Um, do you want to? I can. I can. Yeah. So there, there actually is a um, a trial. Actually, we're going to open up very soon. Actually, here at MD Anderson. Um, so uh, Dr. Olowski actually has been doing a lot of work in his laboratory, um, looking at uh, deletion 17P. Actually, I, uh, kind of a that takes me back to my training. I actually worked in Dr. Lossi's lab for quite some time, actually, when I was a trainee on deletion 17P. So I'm familiar with his projects uh, quite well. Um, and so um, basically, um, and there are other sort of BCMA uh, 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 targeting antibody drug conjugates in development. One is being developed by a company in Heidelberg, Germany, uh, HDP 101. And so the conjugate of this particular drug, the toxin is a little bit different. It's, it's, it's a mushroom toxin, a manstin. And basically this targets uh, RNA polar 2A, which is actually on 17P. And so basically it's often co-deleted with P53, which is the important gene on 17P that confers the poor prognosis and adverse prognosis in deletion 17 patients. So the thought is, is that, well, if you are missing um, your chromosome 17P, this potentially is a therapeutic vulnerability, it potentially makes patients susceptible. If you inhibit polar 2A as well, that's an essential gene essentially for uh, basically producing proteins, ribosomal biogenesis. Basically, these are, I guess, components of the cells are pr uh, for producing proteins. So if you do that, that could be potentially a, a essentially a, a therapeutic vulnerability where you're actually targeting a essentially a passenger gene that's deleted in conjunction with deletion 17P. So that's actually one really exciting modality, uh, potentially and specifically targeting 17P uh, myelin. There's some really nice data of Dr. Lousy's lab looking at this in the preclinical um, setting. And that trial is actually hopefully gonna open up very, very soon here at MD Anderson. And we're excited to see what the results might be. Uh, another question, uh, can someone speak to treatment using venetoclax, daratumumab and dexamethasone together? Sure, I can take this one. So um, I think the unfortunate thing with venetoclax, well, the great thing about venetoclax is patients with translocation 1114, which is about 20% of our myeloma patients have this increase you know, in, in what's called BCL2. It's another protein expression that's increased in venetoclax works by um, going after those cells. So that's one of our first targeted therapies for myeloma that we have specifically for a, a certain gene change. And in patients who have 1114, not only did it help um, get great responses for these patients, but it actually helped not just progression-free survival, but overall survival, meaning that patients live longer because we were able to get this drug to them on the, on the original trial. That's really hard to show for, for most of our patients. It usually takes a long time. So that told us that this drug is really great for patients with love and 14. Unfortunately, that first trial was looking at venetoclax in all myeloma patients. And um, patients who didn't have 1114 actually did worse. Um, and they, they, there are actually patients who died. And so they had to stop the trial because of all these things that were going on until they figured it out. So it slowed down all of the rest of the trials for venetoclax for our 1114 patients. And so what's happened um, is that we still ha don't have it FDA approved. I'm hoping it will be the, the big trial to get the FDA approval is almost done. It's like 85, 90% done. And all the other trials that are looking at combinations also got halted. So again, we have trials looking at combinations, but we don't have the answer yet um, to say that it's FDA approved. Do we use it all the time? Yes. So because we know it's such a great drug, 
despite it not being FDA approved, it's one of the few drugs in myeloma that we can actually get readily um, for 1114 patients only. Um, and we can combine it. So we have combined it with Dara, we have combined it with you know, carfilzomib, we've combined it with bortezomib, um, and it seems to be safe and, and um, it works, but we don't have a lot of data that, that I can really say is, is why we do it, but we just know combination therapy works really well together. Um, and venetoclax does actually improve immune therapy responses for different reasons. So the combination makes sense. I think this kind of speaks to an important also distinction of sort of off-label usage of drugs. And so we were referring to venetoclax as not FDA approved, but it's not FDA approved specifically for multiple myeloma. It's approved for some leukemias and some lymphomas, which is fortunate. So essentially um, we're using this drug. It's approved, it's safe. You can have access to the drugs essentially um, to use in our myeloma patients because it's approved in other indications, but we're using it off-label, not according to the, the specific sort of um, sort of disease that the FDA label has indicated. But because of the promising data with venetoclax and translocation 1114 multiple myeloma, it's actually on the NCCN guidelines as an option, which is a huge deal. And so I think historically speaking, when venetoclax first showed promise in translocation 1114 myeloma patients, it was very difficult as physicians to get insurance to approve of it. Uh, but it, it has helped a lot um, that, you know, for instance, combination with daratumumab, venetoclax, dexamethasone, or carfilzomib, venetoclax, dexamethasone, which was great data published um, in the literature, um, uh, you know, can potentially be available for our patients off-label. Uh, another question, <clears throat> excuse me, what is the experience with the GPRC5D targeted immunotherapies? Can you take this one? And I guess okay. you know, we've talked about it, but if you wouldn't mind just recapping what that is, I know we've talked about it a few times, but it would probably help for online viewers. Sure, I just did a short viewers. video, so you can look at the video too. Um, <laughs> um, so basically we have car -Ts. There's a couple of car -Ts that are um, using the antigen GPRC5D and some bispecifics. And, and the main thing is that we have seen some fantastic responses. So I think Talquetamab is one. Um, and response rates are again, 70% or higher. These are patients who have had, there's patients on the trials who have had BCMA therapy about a quarter. Um, and these are patients who have had, you know, lots of therapy already. So those response rates are fantastic. What's different besides CRS and, and you know, those are similar that we see CRS at a high level, but grade one, grade two, so easy to treat um, for us, but there's different toxicity profile. Um, a third of patients had taste changes for dyskesia. Uh, a third of patients had nail changes. And approximately a third of patients, I think, had skin like rashes and exfoliation. Now, these are all things that once they stopped the drug, if they had to, you know, got better. And, and then they're able to, most of the patients with rash, for instance, were able to go back on the drugs. But because GPRC5D is in myeloma cells as well as hair follicles, we think some of these off, you know, on target off tumor toxicities that can happen. Thankfully, they're not major toxicities. Um, you know, back in the day when we didn't have all these targets, we tried all these types of immune therapies against targets that were unfortunately found in the heart or found in the pancreas. And, you know, the targets that we are now looking at have all been pretty much on plasma cells, myeloma cells, and maybe B cells. Um, and then again, GPRC5D just on um, the hair follicles and, and skin and nail stuff that we see. Yeah, and it'll be interesting to see um, how these toxicities may be different depending on the different modalities of how we target GPRC5D. Right. So currently, I think we probably have the most data with GPRC5D targeted by specific T cell antibodies. So I alluded to in my earlier talk, you know, these are typically continuous therapies that are given on a regular basis. So you're sort of sort of continuing to have that on target off tumor effect potentially against the, the taste buds, the, the nails, the hands. You know, as Dr. Patel mentioned, there are GPRC5D CAR T therapies in development, which is essentially a one time dose, a living drug. Uh, you may not have that continuous sort of targeting of the uh, on target off tumor um, uh, effects on the, the hair follicle, for instance. So, again, we don't have that full data, but potentially the toxicities could be different. Um, does a non secretory patient have any hope of getting into a clinical trial? <laughs> um, a lot of our studies, um, you know, require measurable disease, but that's not to say that, you know, non-secretory patients may not be eligible. I mean, we have trials that allow for um, 
I mean, I guess the question is, are they purely non-secretory? I mean, if that's the case, if, if they're truly non-secretory, then probably not. But if they have some sort of measurable disease, even on imaging, then they may be eligible depending on what um, the protocol eligibility is. Yeah. Oh, um, we have a lot of questions on maintenance. Um, you know, we, we talk about um, be, keeping patients on maintenance too long. What about the other situation where a patient is hesitant to go off of maintenance when you believe they can? What do you do? Um, so we don't have an answer. So no, I, I, you know, we don't, we truly don't have an answer of what's the right number of years for maintenance for different patients. I, I think we all use the data and then sort of use the art of medicine to figure it out with our patients. So for me, every patient that after they've done their transplant and that first time we're talking about maintenance therapy, we discussed the trials that originally talked about maintenance, which are from 2010, 2011. So a, a while back and those original trials, patients had maintenance for 18 months to two years, and then they stopped. Um, we have smaller trials and a lot of retrospective data that really says three years for most of our patients is still probably better than two. We have a trial, the endurance trial, these were patients that did not go to transplant, but they're on maintenance to answer this question. We have more other trials. I know Dr. Lee um, could probably talk more about with, you know, Dara and Len as maintenance. And can we stop after two years or stop after your MRD negative after two years? Are there biomarkers we can use? And in the end, there's a lot of stuff hopefully we'll get in the future that we don't have yet. I will put a caveat. My high-risk patients, this is not the conversation we have. My high-risk patients, we do two or three drug maintenance for, you know, potentially two, three years, and then single agent maintenance, at least if they're still doing well, um, as long as possible. So standard risk patients, which is about 75% of patients, that's the conversation I really have, that most of the data shows that the longer we go, the better. But of course, the toxicity piece is, you know, long-term secondary cancers, which is, which is not high, but 10, 15% is not low either. Um, we talk about clots um, and, and other things that can happen and, and really what their goals in life are, and, and we decide if it's right or not. If patients aren't having any toxicity from it, they're more likely to say, I wanna keep going. If patients are having chronic diarrhea and having issues going out because of their diarrhea, no matter what we've given to help them, they're the ones that are like, yeah, I'd like to stop now. You know, So it really is a, a patient-based um, decision with me, giving them guidance. Uh, sticking with maintenance, uh, a recent study presented at ASH cast doubt on the efficacy of exazomib as a maintenance drug. Going forward, what is the role for this oral, oral proteasome inhibitor, and should patients who are taking exazomib discuss a change of treatment with their doctor? <laughs> I can take it. I can, I can take it. <laughs> Nobody wants yeah. to answer. Yeah, no, I mean, those, those data were very um, informative um, in terms of the role of maintenance exazomib um, in, um, in, in, you know, post-transplant or even patients who are not, uh, didn't undergo upfront transplant. Uh, I think the data, of course, is still maturing, you know, potentially additional data will be um, updated down the road. You know, I think that there, my personal opinion is that there's still um, a role for exazomib in multiple myeloma, you know, particularly in relapse refractory multiple myeloma. You know, the initial trials did show an improvement to progression-free survival in relapse refractory multiple myeloma with at least one prior line of therapy. As I mentioned earlier, one size doesn't fit all for all patients. And so, uh, you know, patients who prefer an oral approach that's more convenient, um, that doesn't require uh, coming in to the clinic to receive injections or infusions, could be a very reasonable approach uh, for treating uh, multiple myeloma. We have a, um, we had a comment, which I should like to share. It says, nurses are great. Uh, <laughs> so we agree with that. Um, can you comment on a free light chain ratio reading 100 as an indication of progression to active myeloma from smoldering? Is this a controversial marker? Let me take, okay, I can take this one. Um, so yes, I think recently, um, maybe at ASH, there was a paper that came out that patients who have a light chain ratio of greater than 100 or less than 0.01, if you have lambda, um, you know, in our IMWG criteria, so it means that you have active myeloma, but really it should be in combination with your urine tests. So light chain disease, 
why we worry about it is that these proteins are small. They can get into your kidneys and cause inflammation. And then you start losing protein and then your kidneys don't work as well. The filters don't work as well. So the first indication to that is if you have Ben's Jones protein in your urine. So there's been this discussion of you really shouldn't call myeloma symptomatic with the light chain ratio of greater than hundred, unless you're seeing those changes in the urine. And, you know, I can anecdotally say I have patients where their light chain ratios are really high, but their kidneys are fine. Their urine's not showing anything. So we're monitoring. We, we've talked about it. We said we could start or we cannot. And I've had some patients I've been monitoring for four or five years now with that high level of light chain, but still not you know, having any protein in their urine. So I think, it, it, yes, I think there's data out there to say that if you have protein in your urine, I don't know what Dr. Lee says. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, certainly at the light chain ratio is 500 and really high, you know, I think that's one thing that, you know, you want to probably start treatment for uh, myeloma if they're previously smoldering myeloma. But I agree with Dr. Patel that I often sit on patients with smoldering myeloma, which the only criteria to actually treat as symptomatic myeloma is a free light chain ratio slightly above 100. And, you know, I think the really important thing in for smoldering myeloma is not just look at sort of the risk strata patient models that are determined at a single time point, but look at the trends, look at the, look at the data over a period of time. I think it's incredibly informative to see the progress and the potential progression of a smoldering uh, myeloma patient. And so if certainly the free light chain ratio is increasing with every serial visit, that would be a concern. You probably need to start treatment at some point. On the other hand, I have patients, just like Dr. Patel, I've sort of been recommending observations, essentially sitting and monitoring patients with free light chain ratios of like 125 or 130. And it's been stable for like four or five, six years or so. And, you know, basically with no end organ damage. And essentially, you know, those patients haven't needed to have treatment at that point. Um, and I would just add that, you know, a patient's cytogenetics would also be a factor. If you have higher risk disease and you have, you know, this higher light chain ratio, you should probably consider starting therapy sooner than later. Uh, could you discuss a stem cell boost to decrease cytopenias to let a, uh, to let a patient be eligible for clinical trial or CAR-T treatment? Sure. I used to be a transplanter in my original days, yeah. so I can take this one. Um, so with most people, when they get go for stem cell collection, you know, we collect as much as we can in those three, four days. Um, so most people have two to three times worth of what they need for a stem cell transplant. So um, at our center, for instance, we keep those cells pretty much forever. And so what happens is over time, as patients get treatment, um, counts start going down, platelets are too low. And when we have trials um, or things like CAR-T where we know it's gonna affect your bone marrow, we wanna make sure you have a minimum platelet level and a minimum white count level and a minimum hemoglobin so that we don't just completely wipe it out because that then puts you at a really high risk of toxicity infections mostly um, after that treatment, let's say CAR-T. So what's happened both before and after. So some patients it's before that if you've had so much therapy and your just counts are too low, and we can't get you on a trial or we can't get you to that next therapy yet you're doing really well and we think there's a chance for this next treatment to work we can get those cells out of the freezer thaw them and then just infuse them like we do blood transfusions things like that and it usually takes a couple of weeks but for for most patients that, that helps that those are the seeds right for your platelets for your white count etc so they eventually get to the bone marrow and they can start working again um, and then we've had a couple of patients where after CAR T, their counts have just gone down and, and didn't come back up. And we've had one patient where we had to give those cells back and the platelets came back up and we were able to give the next line of treatment for that. So we don't do it very often, but um, sometimes those cells that are sitting in the freezer can help in certain situations. Uh, just one, one question was, can we get copies of the slides from the presentation today? And I guess everybody in the room would want to know that too. We will uh, uh, be uh, streaming this uh, webcast live uh, uh, later today, and you can do that all the time, watch that all the time. And in uh, about a couple of months, we will post uh, annotated videos. Uh, we do not share the slides, but you can take uh, screenshots from the uh, presentations when they're up. Um, next question, wait, where was the question I was going to ask? Oh, can you discuss patient recorded, patient reported outcomes, what that means and, and what it's, and I know you talked a little bit about that, uh, Ms. Liu, uh, patient recorded, patient reported outcomes, and how does that help research? <laughs> Sorry. 
Yeah. So yeah, you said. Okay. Okay. So yes. So I think it's patient reported outcomes are usually we do those in clinical trials um, to really measure a lot of quality of life um, aspects of all the therapies we're giving. And we have, you know, um, I can't think of iPad um, uh, tablets that, you know, that we do it on or versus email or written forms. And basically as patients are going through treatment, we want to see how everything is going. Um, symptom wise, um, I forgot how many questions there are on the MMR, the E there's like 30 questions for one and another. There you go. Yeah. Okay. So, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, these are questionnaires that the patient should do like with every cycle and, um, yeah, it really just looks at the quality, the patient's quality of life and the things that they're doing and their activity level. So some of the questions might be like, you know, are you able to do things for yourself? Um, you know, some of the time, all the time, you know, do you need help or questions like, um, are you able to, you know, what, what do you spend most of your days doing? Are you watching TV? Are you able to go out? Um, things like that. And there's 33 questions, um, that you answer on a range sometimes likely, most likely something like that. But yeah, it just kind of tells us, you know, how you're doing on this drug. And it's, it's really important. I would say it's a really component, important component of clinical trials. It's really an opportunity for you to tell um, the, the research team, uh, basically, of how you're feeling, how you're doing on the trial. You know, that's really, really important information um, as we do clinical trials uh, for patients. Yeah, and I think, you know, um, it gives a lot of information to researchers as well as pharma. So as I said before, when we saw that Dara sub Q patients just did so well on it and loved it, you know, all these types of things that patients are doing better. Um, now more and more things are becoming sub Q. It's, it's like, we have to do it sub Q because that's what everybody wants, right? So this, these quality of life um, things are really important and it helps us decide by specific versus CAR T, what sequencing, you know, that's sort of what we always debate um, talking about a one and done. Why is that so great for our patients? Because they love it when they're not on therapy. Um, and I get it, you know, I, I understand why. So I think th th those are things that are, um, we, we kind of look them in the trials are sort of like the add on, but really that is what ends up happening as to how I use trials to then apply that to my patients in real world um, is okay, what are my patients actually going to do well with and what's going to make their quality of life better at the same time. So. And um, I will also say that it's personally informative for me to know how my patients are doing because I have patients who will tell me every time like, oh, I'm doing fine. I'm doing great. No problems, no pain. And then as I look over their questionnaire, it's like, I have pain all the time. And I'm like, this is not what she told me. <laughs> and that, you know, opens the discussion like, okay, well, tell me about this pain. When did it start? Like, what are you doing for it? And it's like, oh, I've been taking, you know, pain medicine every two hours. Well, great. That's <laughs> something we should address. We will know that uh, black Americans have a much higher incidence in myeloma uh, uh, than, than Caucasians and other populations. Um, there's this concept of diversity, equity, inclusion. Could you explain what that is in clinical trials and why it's important? Yeah, I mean, this is a critically important topic. I think this is getting rightfully so increased attention at the FDA level and the regulatory level. You know, unfortunately, for instance, in the last 10 to 15 years with major drug approvals, when you look at sort of the trial patients that enrolled on these studies, there was a large lack of diversity in such trials, a lot, lack of uh, African-Americans, for instance, that enrolled in these trials. So it's, 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 it doesn't make sense when you're sort of applying these drug approvals for the entire myeloma patient population where it excluded, not necessarily purpose excluded, but didn't include uh, a lot of patients who were African American. So this is important information um, that moving forward, I think the, at the FDA level and the regulatory level that they'll, they'll be uh, requiring a clinical trials to have a certain um, you know, amount of diversity and inclusion and making sure that the population that was treated on a clinical trial is truly representative of the real world patient population. Yeah, and I can add, um, a lot of us are doing more studies in the real world. And so um, not that we knew, but looking back on our CAR-T trials on trials, as well as our standard of care at MD Anderson, we actually have 50 to 60% of our patients are minority patients. Um, and that's probably the highest of anywhere. Um, and so we're trying to figure out how can we use this data to improve that everywhere? Because there's a, there's a lot of barriers, right? It's not just one, there's not 10, there's probably like 30, 50 barriers that, that make this 
you have to go through to make this change. Um, and one of the big things I think that's going to help us is looking at the patients who are standard of care, not on trials. 80% of our patients didn't meet eligibility for the, the trials. So now figuring out why. So African-American patients in general have lower white counts without any disease. So if you have a neutrophil count, you have to have a 1.5 and you've never had a neutrophil count of 1.5, you're never gonna be eligible for that trial. So looking at all those little things that would then improve the eligibility to make sure all our patients can get on, um, I think is really, really important. And um, again, the, the, this has changed in the last year or two. And, and I think moving forward, um, we'll see some great things and, and outcomes have never really been reported separately. And I will say our minority patients have actually done better than what clinical trials, um, what they did on clinical trials uh, overall. So knowing that is huge um, because I think reaching out to the community to say, hey, we understand the history of clinical trials. We understand that there's a lot of um, angst about doing clinical trials. And, but, but if we have this disease that we can actually treat and you get these amazing responses, then that's a trial that, you know, we really want to get our patients to um, for the best outcomes. Yeah, and there's data that, sh that shows in retrospective data that African-Americans when treated on the same regimens as, uh, as non-Black patients they actually have better outcomes and with when treated with the same myeloma drugs. That's a critical piece of information. I think that in terms of access to novel drugs, access to clinical trials, um, you know, it's really important. We as a myeloma community really, really focus on this. This is incredibly important that it shouldn't depend on your zip code of how you're treated for myeloma. That's, that's really, really important and that we really, really need to bridge this gap uh, all the more importantly in the next, um, next years. One, one of the things about doing meetings like this is that you, the, the range of our audience is tremendous. You know, we have people who were diagnosed yesterday and people who are long-term uh, survivors and are practically experts on this disease. Uh, I think this is an important question and we don't like to have people, you know, have specific cases, but in this case, I think it's a little bit of an exception to the rule. Uh, and if you could just sort of speak to it more philosophically, uh, the, this woman's husband was recently diagnosed with myeloma. He had indicators that he is high risk, had back fractures, no kidney issues. He is 77 and was very active prior to this. Is he a candidate for stem cell transplant or is he too old? I'll let Karina uh, answer because she's the former transplanter. So. Of course, right. Sorry, I didn't hear how, what was the age? 77. Yeah. First of all, there's no too old. Um, <laughs> so I, you know, I think the role of transplant today is still actually very important. Um, you know, I, you'll see me on talk say that I'm hoping CAR T cells one day will take over transplant because high dose melphalan is sort of my worst enemy. Um, but, but in reality, it has helped our myeloma patients stay in remissions much longer than any other single agent drug, you know, that we've had before. And we've had it since transplant since the 1980s. And that's why it hasn't gone away. And that, that's why it is a standard of care. Um, in terms of age, there is not really an age limit. I, in other countries, there is. Um, so 65 is sort of Europe and in other countries, they, they say that's, that's, that, that's it. If you're younger than 65, you can go to transplant. In the US, that is not the case. Medicare approves transplants for patients. Um, my oldest patient, I think when I started was 86 and he did well. We do a lower dose of chemo. We, you know, we'll change things up to make sure those patients get through. Really, it's about frailty. So if his if he's having frailty issues right now because of the active myeloma, we, we expect that to improve as he gets treatment. And as your myeloma goes down, quality of life usually goes up because the myeloma from the bone fractures, everything else starts healing. And so however, if frailty is an issue because of heart issues or other lung issues, then we might say, well, transplant might not be the right thing because you're higher risk of, of you know, atrial fibrillation, um, arrhythmias, or possibly a higher risk of pneumonias and infections when your white count is low. So really the two big reasons we say that someone's not eligible for transplant is if their heart is not functioning to a certain level, it doesn't have to be perfect, but if it's not to a certain level, or if their lungs, if, if someone's on oxygen, for instance, but then we, we say that's probably too high a risk. Uh, age is just a number. So it's just simply that. So, We've had three yeah. patients go to CAR T with, that are 83 right yeah. now. The so. older I get, the more I agree. <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, there's, as you know, some 80 year old uh, individuals that are like 60 and vice versa. And so age is just a number. And I would like to just, I'm not a transplanter. So I can say this, you know, I have no confident interest related to transplant. 
But um, I would say that transplant is a very important modality in myeloma therapy. You know, it's sort of not, again, the shiny car on, you know, on, the, on the lot uh, compared to some of these other novel therapies, but it's been tried and tested over the years. It's an important weapon in the myeloma arsenal that can be utilized very effectively. So don't discount high-dose chemotherapy and autologous stem cell rescue. It's been tried and tested. And I think, you know, still the bar is there to have something supplanted. And I want to remind people in the room, oh, that's just, uh, if you have questions, throw something at me. I will come right over <laughs> after this question, I promise. Um, and then we'll come back to the online questions. Uh, how, uh, real world evidence, real world data is a big issue these days for researchers in the future of cancer. Can you explain what it is and can it be used to accelerate research and rapidly and credibly answer questions regarding sequencing, subpopulations, and value assessment. Value assessment, I think we're dealing with an insurance person here. Yeah, real world is, real world is incredibly important. There's several registries that are out there looking at um, my little patient's prospective that are collecting data. I'm, I'm personally involved in the steering committees of two large registries to get an insight registry and the Myeloma Connect registry. And we've um, had so much rich data come out from these prospective data registry studies. These are patients that would otherwise not be included on clinical trials. What's going on in the real world? And it's quite shocking, actually. You think that myeloma is treated a certain way algorithmically, but it's actually not that way. There's a lot of heterogeneity in terms of how patients are treated, uh, the different types of patients. And I think you know, this speaks to largely what Dr. Patel had mentioned in, on these clinical trials that are, you know, um, that patients enroll on, there's these strict eligibility criteria, a lot, a lot of the reasons for safety, and we want to make sure that the right patient, right patient seems to be reflective of sort of what happens in the real world. Um, and so you know, this is incredibly important. It, you know, I would say that as patients, if you have the opportunity to participate in real world studies, such as these registry studies, it'd be of an incredible value um, to potentially participate uh, from, from a treatment standpoint, from a value standpoint, from the data that's generated from these studies. Yeah, and I, I can just add, I think, um, so even for things like CAR-T, which is still considered boutique because we don't have enough um, slots for all our patients, really, we're working together with other hospitals now and doing this consortium so we can look at all the patients from all the different centers and really look at differences and outcomes, what seems to be working, what, you know, what, what can we do to, to improve our knowledge base for standard of care patients. So manufacturing is different when it comes to standard of care now compared to what it was like. So figuring out what, what's changed in the real world that, that may be um, making cells is a little bit harder. So what, how can we know what therapy not to use right before we try to collect cells or what, what level um, do we need to hold therapy off for? Um, so all those things that we can't really answer on trials, we're real world when, when things usually happen, we have so many more patients that can get those treatments. So just the volumes help us get that answer a lot faster than on trials where we might have 100 patients or you know 150 patients. Um, and I think things like the health tree and all these other things that are out there now that can actually help us even faster. So I know patients can go on, put their data in there. We can send surveys out. We can even potentially do blood work for all these different patients, which was really hard before for a single center to do, or even, I mean, just the lawyers getting involved at all the different centers to say, who's going to own this, who, who, how, who's going to be you know, in charge of this, et cetera. It made it really difficult. Now, I think with organizations like this, um, there's so many more things we can do and, and get answers faster. My, my question um, is for doctors um, Patel and Lee, and it's not, it's not so much about clinical trials, although clinical trial will be in this question too, but when, if I was a new patient coming to you initially diagnosed, walk me through how you would present all of this information to me, whether it's my short-term goals or you have long-term goals for me as a patient, and what would that include? Because we have a lot of patients in here or caregivers where, and online too, where we're all at different points in our journey. You know, some of us, some of us may be two months, four months, six years, 12 years. So how do you communicate that to your patients, uh, the short-term and long-term goals for them? 
Yeah, I, I, that's a very important question. And I, I really think that the first consultation, the first time I see a newly diagnosed myeloma patient, I spend quite a bit of time with the patient just explaining what myeloma is, what are the different markers that we're looking at? Essentially, for those um, who have been with me in the clinic, I usually draw out this diagram on a piece of paper. I give it to you, you know, when you leave so you don't take notes as much, uh, just to make sure that everyone is on the same page of sort of what our approach is, what the expectations are, what are the prognoses, what do the genetic markers, what do the FISH studies mean? And, you know, it, it allows sort of everyone to sort of level set sort of the the knowledge and sort of what, what we all know about the myeloma. And I, I think this is an ongoing dialogue. I think, for, for instance, when I first see a patient and I, I tell them they have newly diagnosed myeloma needs treatment, I can imagine it can be incredibly overwhelming. I mean, I can't imagine what patients are thinking about in terms of all the different thoughts that are going on. If you don't have any qu questions the first time, that's normal. I mean, there could be a feeling of feeling overwhelmed. And as you go along with your treatment, you'll learn more about myeloma. You can go on the websites like Health Tree, for instance, you'll learn more about where the you know, questions I, I should be asking. And so I think just having that constant dialogue with your doctor and you know, in, with the patients is really, really important. Um, you know, because myeloma is, um, you know, because for a good reason that myeloma patients are living longer and longer, uh, I think there is a deep relationship to develop between myeloma doctors and their patients. And, and as time goes on, I think there's a better understanding of sort of what the individual goals are for patients in their treatment. Yeah, and I can sort of second that. I think just like all of us, we're different in how we approach things. My patients are all different and what they need is different. What they want to talk about is different and, and what order they want to talk about it is different. So our first appointment really usually is pretty um, regimented in that usually my nurse practitioner actually goes in for us and she loves to teach. So that's where she does the myeloma teaching, just the myeloma 101, as we call it. And I call it her abstract art, just like Dr. Lee. She's better at art than I am. Um, and then when I go in, it really is about what treatment do we pick and why? And, you know, I think and again, talking about usually the first appointment, we still have tests to do. So I don't have all the answers. So I talk about, you know, what we need to do, why we need to do it. And what are the big principles for treatment in myeloma? And then with each appointment, so most of my patients I see at least once a month or, you know, somebody seeing once a month and we'll see, um, I'll see them at least once every couple of months. Um, and right before transplant, for instance, or right after transplant, we see again. So we talk about the different stages. We sort of talk about what to expect, but then at each point we go into much more detail. Um, for instance, when patients have been on maintenance by two years, that's really when I start talking about how long are we supposed to do maintenance for? What are your goals? You know, what, what is it that you want to do in life? You know, what are your toxicities? Um, different patients have different toxicities. So we do that consent, you know, at the very beginning of any, any therapy, there's like a billion things on there that we go through, but not everybody's going to get all those. Some people don't get any, some people get a few. So as I like to call it functional risk, as time goes, things change. We want to keep talking about those things. And in the end, it really should be about what your goals are and how we can align to make those happen with the best therapies available and the least toxicity available. So I start at the beginning. So if we have clinical trials available at the beginning, you know, we don't always have them. Um, it, it, clinical trials, and I'll give this to Becca because she can be able to tell you about the logistics of sort of long-term what happens with clinical trials. But if I have a trial, if we have smoldering patients that have trials. So we even patients who are smoldering in MGUS, we talk to them about clinical trials and there's different kinds. Some are just surveys, some are actually medications. Um, you know, we talk about all that. Um, if someone's newly diagnosed and I have a clinical trial for it, I talk about it. Um, if we don't have one, I usually try to say, so right now, these are the different standard of cares we have. This is what I think will be the best. And then we talk about logistics and everything else where, you know, we, we come up with the best treatment. And then I'll talk about clinical trials, maybe at maintenance, because now we have maintenance trials again. So each step we have trials, um, but it changes. So it just depends on when you're coming to see me. Yeah. And I, I would just say like, it's always a good question to ask your clinic team, you know, what trials am I eligible for? And if you're not eligible now, it doesn't mean that you won't be eligible down the line. And at least they can tell you like why you aren't eligible. So if it's your counts next time you can say, well, my counts are better. Am I eligible? And you know, it's, it's always a good discussion to have. Um, the more informed you are, the better you're able to weigh the pros and cons of your, of your treatment.
What is a level 14 patient? Are there different kinds of myeloma? I don't, I mean, what was y'all were saying something about level 14? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. 11. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. So, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Do you, you want to take it? Well, uh, um, Yes, yes, there are, and that, that's sort of, that's what we're referring to sort of when it comes to risk stratification or basically trying to um, determine what types of myeloma an individual patient has. So we do something called fish testing for us in cytohybridization, basically looking for recurrent genetic abnormalities that have been found in myeloma patients over the period of time that can inform prognosis. So on a very fundamental basic level, um, all your cells in your body, including your myeloma cells, have 23 pairs of chromosomes. And so there can be genetic abnormalities in your myeloma cells that can inform prognosis. So when we say a translocation 1114, there is a gene on chromosome number 11 on, on your cells called CCN D1, cyclone D1. And it's basically juxtaposed or basically meshed with the uh, uh, immune heavy chain enhancer, which is basically on chromosome number 14. It basically brings the two genes together and increases the amounts of cyclone D1 in the myeloma cells, which helps promote the growth of the myeloma cell. And so that's what we're referring to a translocation 1114. And that there's a certain drug called Beniteclax, which is an oral pill that has shown very good responses, particularly in patients with translocation 1114. So I have another question that's kind of complicated, but uh, we've been kind of beating around it and sometime directly talking about it. And uh, this one goes actually to the trial nurses, which are patient's best friends beside the doctors. Uh, so I'm a big advocate of quality of life. And yeah, I want my life saved, but you know, I don't want to be bedridden while that, you know, for the whole time. And <clears throat> so some of us are on long-term, I'm on long-term maintenance, you know, I'm in six years maintenance now. And a lot of times I'm not aware of quality of life um, things that have been maybe made better or solved because it's, I'm not at my initial, you know, uh, meeting or something. So I'm going to ask a direct question. And this is because I got uh, called the other day from MD Anderson because um, they wanted to see if I qualified for a uh, neuropathy trial. And so are there any breakthroughs or are there a major studies for quality of life issues like chemo brain or fatigue or, or neuropathy, or is it just kind of incremental things? So no, great, great questions. And I think we have different departments at MD Anderson that help us with these things. And, and it's because for us, we are doing all of these trials that have components of quality of life, but not necessarily directed at the quality of life, right? They're directed at the myeloma. So we have a great supportive care group and integrative medicine group that actually does do trials. Now during COVID, I know a lot of things shut down. Um, our pain team, for instance, also does some clinical trials. So neuropathy specifically, you know, I know that um, Dr. Abdi had come from the University of Florida where he did a lot of scrambler therapy stuff um, for neuropathy. And that's really what one of the trials he was doing for patients that get neuropathy with certain um, and again, it, it sort of halted and I know some of my patients are going back on there now. So I, I think that they're starting to open it up. Integrative medicine, you know, using non-medicine related things to help with symptom um, management. So even acupuncture, um, things like meditation and massage, all these other things with nausea and again, even, even neuropathy um, that have shown some responses for that. And then I think um, chemo brain. So we actually do have researchers at MD Anderson or neuro neurology department that have labs that they're, they are doing um, studies, preclinical studies. Um, and again, that one's really tough, right? I, I, I agree. Um, chemo brain is one of the biggest things, especially after transplant. You know, I tell my patients, you know, we talk about the nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and all that, but the chemo brain, most, most transplant doctors, you know, will, will say, yeah, it will get over. But some of my patients, even six months later, are still having a hard time with that short-term memory and, and all of that. It does improve over time. But again, is there something that can make it come back faster, right? As of right now, I don't have anything, but I know people that are trying to figure that out. But each therapy is different. And so it really is talking to these folks on our, you know, if, if things are not getting better, if they're worsening, maybe getting into those departments um, to get a second opinion from them, if there's something else we can do. And, and then if it is the drug itself, 
and we really haven't been able to help you and things are worsening, that's when I talk to my patients about backing off on that maintenance, right? Or holding it and seeing if it helps. Um, Cause again, for some of these symptoms, everybody's different on their threshold and how it's affecting their life. And so if it's really affecting your quality of life to where you can't work anymore, you know, I have patients who are like, I still have to work for my insurance and my brain, I need it. And I can't think anymore. Well, that's, that's pretty big. Um, and then I have patients who are like, yeah, my neuropathy is there, but you know, it's not really bothering me and I'm fine. So then we keep going. Right. So that's where we need you to tell us like, Hey doc, this is really affecting me. And I really need to talk about it so that we can, you know, really address it then. I'd like to just, we had a couple of online questions that go to what Douglas said in his intro that I think is good. And I guess the way, how do you balance long-term maintenance in patients who have long-term MRD negativity? How do you determine when's the time? Uh, and is that long-term maintenance on the people who have long-term MRD negativity good or bad for them? Or do we need real world evidence? Yeah, this, is a, this is a great question. I think this is one of the really unanswered questions uh, that's, that's been evaluated prospectively in clinical trials that need to be answered. And so there are ongoing studies looking at this in terms of patients that achieve MRD negativity or have MRD negativity on maintenance therapy, then they're essentially randomized, either continue maintenance therapy or stop maintenance and see if there's, what are the long-term outcomes? Is there any detriment to stopping maintenance therapy at that point? You know, in the absence of that, um, that specific data that we're awaiting, um, it's really a conversation about quality of life, what the patient's wishes are, you know, and, and essentially trying to make the best judgment call, you know, that meets the needs of the individual patient. I would say that, you know, for MRD negativity um, what would make me more confident of potentially stopping treatment and uh, maintenance therapy would be something called sustained MRD negativity. So essentially, you know, there are sort of uh, limitations with our current ability to uh, assess MRD. Essentially we do a bone marrow biopsy. Uh, we sample a very specific area of the bone marrow to look for mineral residual disease. That's what MRD stands for. And there could be potential sampling error, other, um, uh, potential uh, limitations that may give a, a false uh, negative potentially. So having sort of serial uh, bone marrows that show MRD negative would add confidence. Another aspect is also doing imaging as well. So, you know, if I'm considering stopping maintenance therapy, I will, you know, get imaging, whole body imaging with a whole body PET CT, whole body, just to make sure that we're not missing something that's, you know, maybe a small area of active myeloma before saying, you know, stopping maintenance therapy. So there's different tools that we currently use um, to make that decision. But I think as a starting point to have that conversation, I typically do the full assessment of looking for sustained number of negativity, doing the imaging uh, before, you know, stopping. And I think that's um, in the absence of data, there's no right or wrong answer at this point. And so it really, it's really comes down to the individual patient. As Dr. Patel alluded to earlier, if a patient has high risk myeloma, even though they have MRD negativity, it does make me much more reluctant to advise stopping maintenance therapy unless there's a significant quality of life issue. Yeah, and just to play devil's advocate on the MRD issue, we all have lots of patients who have still an M protein, right? After they had their treatment, they had their transplant, they're on maintenance for a couple of years, and that M protein just never went to zero, but their myeloma is actually really well controlled and we call it like MGUS like. So some of those patients, you know, if they're having toxicity issues and I know their standard risk and I know they're otherwise doing well, I might stop their maintenance after a few years because they're having toxicity or just long-term, like, I just want to stop. I want to be off all chemo. This is one, my, my one chance right now. Then we had that discussion. And again, th that that's the hard part of MRD, just using just that you're going to miss the patients who actually have indolent disease that's actually controlled. Um, and we might be over treating those folks. So I think there's those are the nuances that that we'd be able to help with, you know, to make those decisions. Yeah, it, it, you definitely agree with that. MRD is not, it's not a binary outcome. Like if you're MRD negative, that's success. MRD positive is a failure. I would definitely not think about it like that way, particularly, you know, after transplant, for instance, it's not the end all be all. Certainly it's, we all want to be MRD negative. We want patients to be MRD negative, but again, it's not the end all be all. I have a patient, you know, in my clinic that has a residual M protein 0.2, 0.3, I mean, is they for 10 plus years and, and patient is doing fine. So there are these examples where having residual disease has 
you know, no long-term detriment. It just depends on the underlying biology of the myeloma. So we uh, owe this question to the Health Tree newsletter, something Kelly saw recently in there. But as far as the, I was curious how often you see patients that have um, genetic differences uh, dependent on maybe cells from different locations in the body um, and how you approach treatment in a situation like that. Yeah, that's a great question. It's kind of speaks to the, um, the top of a clonal heterogeneity, basically that even, you know, of course there's different myelomas between different patients, but within the same patient, there's actually different genetic makeups that it makes it a lot, even more complicated actually um, in terms of how we would potentially approach myeloma. And so in the initial sequencing studies by Jens Lords at the, at the Broad Institute, this was published probably a decade ago in, newly, in, in, in sequencing uh, multiple myeloma patients, they did find that on average about three to five subclones actually per patient actually with, with multiple myeloma. And so what happens is potentially that, you know, for instance, you're treating one clone effectively um, you know, in a patient with myeloma and it and causes a decrease in that particular population, but potentially allows room or expansion of another clone, basically. And that becomes a problematic clone essentially uh, down the road. And so, um, so that's something definitely um, that is an area of ongoing and future research. Uh, you heard Dr. Lousy talk a lot about single cell sequencing. And so looking at really what is the myeloma doing at the single cell individual level? What are the differences between the cells and how can we effectively target, you know, the myeloma, um, you know, in totality, not just particularly targeting a specific clone is, is a really, really important area of, of cancer research in general, but also in, of course in myeloma as well. Yeah, and I think right now to apply it clinically, right? Your question of, do we treat it differently? Very few patients are we doing multiple biopsies on at the same time in that same time period to really say that what's going on in different, and because we don't really have targeted therapies for most of these things, um, really it's a it's more of a how aggressive is your myeloma? What's happening? What are the therapies you've responded to before? And, and really go after that. Now, if there is something that's high risk in one versus the other, then yeah, we're gonna take the higher risk and say, okay, we need to be more aggressive but there's not specific therapies as of yet, you know, in the future, if all these targeted therapies that are being researched come down the road, then maybe we do combinations and stuff. But right now um, there's a few studies where someone had myeloma in the bone marrow that we, you know, looked at, and then maybe a plasma cytoma that's outside. And that's where we see these differences. Um, but we don't have enough information yet to say, should we treat this one differently than the one that's in the bone marrow? Um, hopefully in the future that we'll have more information on that. Well, I want to thank you very, very, very much for your answers and for your time. Um, I'd like to welcome, I'd like to thank our afternoon faculty. You guys can head on out. <laughs> uh, before I hand it over to Jenny uh, to close the program, I just wanted to talk, uh, I just want to say something. Myeloma is tough. Myeloma is really difficult, and we're all coming in at different times and we have different ways of doing things. And one of the things I really am proud of with this particular program, the way it's evolved and, and the faith that Jenny has put into it uh, is that I'm a former middle school and high school teacher and soccer coach. And that's basically who I still am. Um, and when I was a teacher, my philosophy was I don't care if my kids know everything. I want them to know a lot about something but I don't care if they know the spectrum of stuff. And that's sort of the philosophy I have with this. As much as we went over today, there's a lot of stuff we didn't go over. And that's why we have our other programs. And that's why I encourage you to tune in. We didn't talk today about imaging and why that's, I mean, there are so many topics out there. But as you leave here, don't feel intimidated by the fact that you don't understand some things and that you don't get some things. The importance is that you get something. And the real importance is not that you're an expert at this disease, but that the next time you go to your doctor's office, you are better equipped to ask better questions. Because that's really what treatment is all about. Patients who ask the best questions generally get the best care. And that's why we're here. And um, you have to 
be engaged with this disease. It's been thrown upon you. It's been thrust upon you. You didn't ask for it. Well, you're stuck with it now, unfortunately. And the good news is, as you see, it's not great news for everybody, but the good news is increasing for everybody every year. And I wanna make one last point to get you to understand why this is such an optimistic time uh, when you're sitting where I am, working with patients and not a patient. Um, the last NCI SEER statistics, the official database of statistics that we use, uh, was published in 2017. I mean, that's where the statistics go up to, I should say, the most recent published statistics. And I've been monitoring these statistics literally for more than 20 years. And what has struck me in the last six to seven years is that there are 10,000 more Americans living with myeloma every year. So if you think about that, the last time we had official statistics was 2017, there were about 130,000 Americans living with myeloma. So how many years ago was that? That's five years ago. So you add 50,000 to that. Realistically, we have, you know, you see the official statistics, 120,000 people living with myeloma. I think that's a lie. I think it's closer to 160, 170. And next year it's gonna be 180. And the year after that, it's gonna be 190. And we are moving to a cure. And this is why you are here. And this is why this is important. And we would not be here without Jenny Alstrom. When I met Jenny, the myeloma crowd was one person. And she was and the crowd was one person for three years. What you don't see behind the scenes is we now have a staff approaching 40. Over. See, I, I don't work in the office, so I don't see them. Uh, that's a remarkable thing. We, you would not believe the kind of people we have behind the scenes. People who know nothing about myeloma, but they know everything about computers. They know everything about programming and they are all compassionate. They all understand why we're doing what we're doing. So remember that and tune into our future programs. We do these in the real world. We do six of these a year in the United States, I hope. And as those of you who have learned us during the pandemic, we did lots of webcasts for you and we kept them short. Um, so join us in the future, ask the right questions and always reach out. You know, if you've got a question about something, I'm here, you know where to find me, you know where to find Jenny, you know where to find us. Just ask us. The worst we can do is say, we don't know. Okay, so thank you for coming. Well, I just want to reiterate a thank you to the amazing faculty that were here. So let's just give them another round of applause. I love coming to these because I love meeting you and I love hearing from the experts. It's very clear why we need an expert on our team, how nuanced myeloma is, how complicated it is. Um, my life personally has been blessed because of MD Anderson and their care. So I just want to say just a personal thank you to the doctors there and this wonderful facility. You're so fortunate to have that. You look at the West where I am living right now and we have one facility and they're you know trying to grow a program there, but nothing, nothing that's even close in terms of like number of clinical trials open and and things like that. So you're very fortunate to live in this area. A lot of things that we heard about today, um, we're working on uh, for Health Tree, like finding clinical trials. To me, clinicaltrials.gov is a total nightmare. So you can use the Health Tree Cure Hub to find personalized, a personalized list of clinical trials. You don't have to sort through 450 open clinical trials on that, that government tool that I don't think is that helpful. Uh, we talked about patient reported outcomes and everybody talks about doing data um, work on healthcare data, but we don't get to, if we don't have patient reported outcomes, everything's open loop. We have no, we have no answers or conclusions because we never know how the patients eventually did, um, especially patients who weren't in clinical trials. So that's the value. If we didn't participate in a clinical trial, how did something work in the real world? Um, or how did it compare? So some of those things, um, real world evidence studies too, like we'll, we will be running a, a CAR T study to see some of these things and to learn some of these things, like what's the best bridging therapy or things like that. So participate in the things that we have to offer because together 
we are helping advance the science. And I just want to thank you so much for coming, so much for watching, and thank you. Have a great evening.